Hello and welcome. This is the Mutiny Investing Podcast. This podcast features long-form conversations on topics relating to investing, markets, risk, volatility, and complex systems. This one's likely to never going to get published due to compliance reasons, but let's record it anyway. Um, for those of you not watching the video that are just listening on audio, uh, hopefully you're used to my voice now. This is Jason from Mutiny Funds. And uh, I've got both Darren and Noel with me. And so just uh, from the voice sense, maybe we'll, we'll kick it off with Noel first. But the idea was, you know, Darren and I were having a discussion about uh, what's it like to be a, a DIY trader and like what's a, you know, how do you raise assets if you wanted to? Or more importantly, you know, how do you maybe go work for a prop shop or what is it like to own a prop shop and then search out those traders? And I just thought, you know, why not instead of us having a private conversation, let's try to record it. And uh, this could be valuable to hopefully a lot of people, assuming we'll, we ever publish it. Um, so maybe, Noel, maybe I guess maybe the quick thing maybe would be just like kind of give a background on your prop shop experience or and then your trading before the prop shop. So that maybe that'll give us kind of a jumping off point. Sure. So I started prop trading in 96. I was a stockbroker for about 18 months before that. So that's what, that's how I figured out what time the stock market opens. And that kind of stuff. But um, when I was initially a prop trader, I went to go work from, for a guy that uh, spun out of Susquehanna and then Stafford. And I was basically the guy that went and got coffee, got tacos, and all those other super sexy jobs. And that was it. And prop trading, you know, for anybody who doesn't know, is simply just trading your own money. It's like, you know, a glorified version of you on your Robin Hood app, just trying to figure out which way Tesla is going to go tomorrow. Right. So uh, part of that is, and you and I were just talking right before uh, Darren jumped on, is I, over the last decade, I personally have been always like Googling prop shops and figuring out like, how could I work at a prop shop? Like all of those things. And there's just zero information out there. Or there's a lot of BS information where almost like you have to like yeah. buy your seed or buy your drawdown, you know, like kind of thing where it's like kind of pay to play. So I guess like the first question, and, and Darren, you're going to be much better asking questions about this stuff is like, if I, if I am a, a prop trader and I'm just like trading, you know, out of my basement or at home and I'm doing very well for myself, like, is there still any legitimate prop shops left? Or like, how would I even think about getting in touch with them? And like, what is that, what does that process even look like to begin with? Me or Darren? Oh, sorry for you, Noel. And then Darren, Darren, you can just start jumping in and peppering with questions. So, uh, so I'll give you my answer real quick. Um, all the major firms that you would probably don't even think are prop shops kind of are like Citadel. We pick on them because Ken Griffin buys a giant house every other week. So he gets a lot of press, but um, you know, there's Citadel asset management, which is the hedge fund. And then there's Citadel securities, which is really just a prop firm. It's the same. Susquehanna is the same. Jump is the same. Uh, you know, uh, there's tons of them, but the reason that you don't know anything about them is because um, no, but they don't want you to. There's nothing in it for them. So this is actually boomeranged back on me as somebody who's launched a hedge fund because, you know, I'm 52 years old and nobody's ever heard of me outside of the, the prop trading community. So when I talk to people about raising money or whatever else, like never heard of you guy. I don't you know, have any idea what your background is. But because of that, I mean, I haven't had social media, uh, you know, until like 18 months ago. I've had nothing. So you really had to try pretty hard to figure out anything about my background, but that's been deliberate on my end. I've actually you know, gone through great pains to not be a public entity on any level. And that's how a lot of prop firms are because it really doesn't help them. And frankly, it can probably hurt them for anybody to really know what it is they do. Yeah, that's, like that's that. That, no, I was gonna say real quick, Jason, like uh, even as an independent retail person um that's the thing you run into when you start researching for prop shops is that it's almost like you know to use a sports betting equivalent it's almost like a billy waters type syndicate sort of cottage industry where it's like you know nobody really knows and then when you ask or you try to go through the sort of uh legitimate channels like there's nothing really mentioned about it and the stuff that is available like you said there's one firm in particular, there's two, but they kind of merged um, that I won't name on the podcast, but um, they call themselves prop, but, you know, they're making between seven to eight figures off of an educational arm where people are paying for everything from learning how to day trade and scalp stocks to income trading. Um, and that's what, and that's positive to, 
retail who doesn't know, who's naive, who's ignorant, as an opportunity to be on the prop desk. And not to say that those firms don't prop trade. I know the parent company got went through a pretty serious SEC audit. So that like they are trading and they're making really big money, but just like in the actual prop world, um, to get into one of those coveted seats and get a decent sized line as an individual trader, it's basically just who you know. Um, yeah. I just felt like that, the, but the Hunger Games advertising and info products is just so gross to me and it's so disgusting because these are people who are already undercapitalized and then you're gonna ask them to put up six, seven, eight, nine grand for a course for the potential to just, to potentially start off as basically like a clerk or an assistant on your desk, which, you know, they're located in New York City in a very expensive place. So it's, it, you just start thinking about it, you follow it, you like, oh, okay, they just don't want, this isn't a serious thing. Um, so yeah, from the retail side, everything that Noel said, like, is absolutely, it's, it's been verified based on my research. Noel, do you think like maybe that's a good place to start for, um, you know, what we'll call it retail. We'll just keep calling it prop traders maybe throughout this. It's like if you're doing it yourself as a prop trader and you're looking at maybe a prop firm, one of the initial red flags is maybe, I, and you might disagree with me, it's like on the, if they want you to pay for your education or they want you to put up money for the drawdowns, because then typically aren't they then for in that scenario, they're teaching you how to trade strategies that have high churn because they're making a huge spread on the commissions. And that's actually where they're making money as a firm with all these quote unquote, you know, prop traders that are actually, you know, trading, you know, so many times a day that they're just churning them out and then they're just burning through the commission trade. Like what, what should people, yeah. what, let's start with that. What are the red flags? So I don't want to speak out of ignorance. I haven't looked for a prop trading job in a very long time. So it is not fair for me to com comment on, you know, with the landscape that you guys are talking about because I've, I, this, this pay to play notion is I'm aware of it, but I've never had to deal with it. I don't know of any real prop firms. They're going to ask you to write them a check. Zero. Hard zero. Um, they will ask you to get tacos. They will ask you to sweep the floors. They will ask you to scrub whatever. Um, and they won't feel bad about it, but they will not ask you for money. So if you want to go get a job at, I don't know, Susquehanna, they're not going to ask you to write them a check. They will give you money and they will ask you for tons of effort and a very large commitment. But if you're talking about like the, the SIG, the Jump, Peak Six of the world, they're typically training their own traders, like getting them That's out of college, right. right? And kind of raising them up. So what are the options for like somebody that actually has a PL? And then also like, how would you think like to get your PL like, uh, you know, accredited by some, some sort of third party entity is also difficult where people even look at yeah. it. That, so that's common sense do? though. So you show up with your PL and you say, okay, I have, um, I have IP and I have no money or I have money and IP, which is the best combination. But if you can convince somebody who's got money that you can make them money, you could probably get a job. It's very hard to do that because a lot of the guys that are in the hiring position for prop firms are exceedingly smart. They've seen it all. They've heard all of the nonsense stories and um, those jobs are hard to get, but they pay really well. I mean, there's people one year out of college that are making six, 700 grand and you're not gonna convince somebody to give you that kind of money unless you can octuple verify everything you said. Which is really hard to do, doing a verifiable track record, right? When you've been trading on, on your own. Sorry, go ahead, Darren. Right. Yeah, no, I was going to say that that's really hard. And then on top of that, um, the stuff that you're doing as an individual retail guy, even on a prop firm, which to me is kind of like just swashbuckling whatever edge there is across global markets, whatever your edge is, right? Like, even in, for that type of formalized entity, a lot of the stuff that you do as a retail person may not even be a good fit or scale to those operations, let alone like a traditional hedge fund or a bank desk if they exist anymore. Um, so that's the other thing is like, as a retail person, is what you're doing tractable and portable enough to be able to fit into even a prop desk, which is pretty liberal in terms of what you're allowed to trade and the edges you can explore. And part Agreed. of that is, no, like, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and maybe this is kind of where Darren was headed to, is historically, and I may be incorrect about this, but like a lot of prop shops had a really tight stop losses. Like if you blew out like 5% on the year, you're just shut down. So you had to have very conservative strategies, and then maybe you're using house money as you start to increase your P&L. Is that still the case, or is it, are they allowed like a wide swath of strategies? Because a lot of times if you, if you had like a, a, a more like 
you know, longer term convergent strategy, there was no way you were going to ever work at a prop shop because your drawdowns would just blow you out like immediately. Yeah. So that's true and not true. The public answer is that okay. it's true. It's not true in the sense that like I, I've personally backed over 100 guys. So so let's just say we have guy A and guy B. Uh, guy A makes money and guy B loses money. But then you you you, you call them into your office. And you say, OK, guy B, um, you know, why do you why do you make money? Why do you lose money? And there is some sense of just common sense to this. Did the guy who lose, lost money, was he you just unlucky? And is his strategy otherwise still a good strategy? And the guy that made money, did they just get lucky and make a bunch of money? Are they just yellowing a bunch of Tesla calls or something? Um, there, I've been mad at guys who have made money and I've been happy with guys that have lost money because they're doing it for the right reasons. And the process is quantifiable and repeatable. So that's the answer. So if you've got a guy that, that lost 5%, but he's but you know he's doing it right, you're going to give him a pass. Or you get another guy that's down 1% and he's a, he's a goofball, shows up late, leaves early. Adios. So back in the day when you were like in Chicago, was it just like the serendipity of like who was in your building? You could find individual traders there. Like how did no. you actually like source these 100 guys? Like how did they that's find you? Question. Like how did you find them? So um, initially it was guys that wandered in my office, you know, knock, knock, knock. Hey, can I have a job? Um, you know, I work for peak six down the hallway or I work for, you know, Wolverine up a floor. And so that's a real thing. Um, but the, the really good P and L generators, the earners, uh, you know, they're not knocking on doors. It's the guys that have blown out or just can't make money or whatever else. So generally speaking, it's through a, it's just like anything else. It's through a conduit, somebody, you know, in common. And then when we wanted to hire a new crop of, of people, I would personally go to universities, um, you know, like universities we all know about and interview people. And I've interviewed thousands of people and with varying success. So we would, we would hire people out of college and I've got a million interview stories, some really funny ones, but you know, generally speaking, we would have a first or second interview on campus with a junior guy that would get escalated up to me. We would do a battery of questions and quizzes. And if they didn't have any trading knowledge, we would go into math and stats and probability and then just general knowledge about things in the world, like how many fish are in the sea. I mean, those are real questions and those are, but reasoning through these questions uh, gives you a window into their process and logic. And then you, you figure it out and you make a decision. I know you just used uh, Darren's favorite word, earners. So I know he's happy yeah. just having this conversation. I, I, Darren probably uses yeah. earners like every other sentence when we talk. It was like, is somebody a good earner? But like, is that, has that changed in modern times? Like would, would almost That's advice be like a good, set, a good set of luggage? Like, should you just move to Chicago, hang out around the CME and the SIBO and all those bars that are around there as soon as the markets close and maybe hang out in those bars and just start to get to know people? Or like, <laughs> what would be the, what would be that, what's the wedge? For anybody currently like in, in 2022 to try to get into a prop. I don't, I don't actually think it's that hard. Um, so the idea that you have to, you know, hang out at the preferred bar or whatever else, most of the people really making decisions aren't usually degenerate alcoholics or whatever else. I mean, I guess that exists, but generally speaking, the real people making real money are smart, real people and they work hard and they, you know, do their thing. So if you have a verifiable track record, you can pre-answer every question that somebody's going to want to know, which is really the only, there's only one real question. How do you make me money with a little, there's little effort on my end. I want to do nothing and I want you to be in my life and make me money. That's it. Everything else is just like, you know, nonsense and it adds to the complications. But all you want to know is, will this person give, make me money? Yes or no. Next question is less important. But if you can prove to somebody that you will make them money and cause them no hassles, no compliance issues, no just stupid drama, you can get a job. And if you can just get in front of those logical questions, which is make it as simple and easy for the person interviewing you as possible to give you money, they will give you money. Right, but part of that is though, I, I agree with everything you're saying, that's perfect. But like the question still remains is actually the very first step is how do you even find those people to get in front of to show like you can make them money, right? That's, that's the rub, right? So I'm a, bad, I'm a bad, bad person to ask only because I already know but if I didn't know anybody, what, what would I do? Just right. pound LinkedIn or something like that? You know, so if I saw this interview, right, I would you know, see this interview in a week. I would, you know, LinkedIn, all three of us, and I'd be like, hey, man, I'm a know-nothing guy that knows nothing. But by the way, I got a great P&L, and I'm happy to have it audited. I, sp I spent six grand of my seven grand to send it to Ernst & Young, and they've, it's got the stamp of approval. This is all legit. I will go to the mats on this idea. 
all I want to do is give you a chance to show you how I make you money. Like, okay, I'll take a look. Please send, please send those DMs to Nolan Darren, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not to me. Ew. Um, but that's <clears throat> part of it, though. My next like question on that, Noel, is like, historically too, like, do you want people that are trading like a singular strategy, or can they have a broad set of strategies? Right. Can they run an ensemble approach? Like, it always yeah. seems like prop shops is like one instrument, one trade, or is that is that is that fallacious? Yeah, it, it's. It is definitely fallacious. Um, if, if you are in a situation where you don't know anybody in the business, there's no way you know 10 good trades. If you have been lucky enough to source out, you know, Japan versus Germany versus Iceland versus Mars, and that's somehow the way you make money, it's taken you a lot of time and a lot of effort to figure that out. And if you're the only guy on the planet or a small subset of people that know how to do this, there's just no way you also know 25 other trades. Um, it just, it's not possible. And if you, if you, if you're a heart surgeon, you can't also be, you know, a rocket scientist or, you know, uh, whatever. There's just too much information in any one person to do all that stuff. Now those are extreme examples, but you can learn these things in time. But if you don't, if you already have that much skill, you already have a job. And how you get that information is you go get a job at Susquehanna using them and they put you on the bond desk and then you do a good job and then a guy gets fired on the gold desk and you go learn gold. Then you go learn oil. Then you go learn equities. That's how you get that breadth of knowledge. But you're not going to teach yourself that stuff. It's just too hard. Yeah, that was kind of my question is like the comp like you show your competence through one trading strategy. And then when you're getting in there, you're getting mentored on all these different desks and you can ask all these different questions and you can learn yes. how to broadly apply your skill set is kind of the way to think about it. Yes, that's exactly right. But even still, what if you're like a former group one junior trader and you've been making markets on 30 different single stock equities? Um, I would think that would still be difficult to switch over to like the quote unquote hedge fund side of Citadel, right? Like, yes. you know, cause like it's a, so you, in other words, you're filtering and filtering and refining your filter until you get a very small subset of traders that can actually fit within the prop framework because like former market makers i mean some of them could i'm sure but a lot of them are horrible position traders they totally. really only know mispricings and quasi ar arbitrages right like not necessarily position taking a position like so if you think about it from the options perspective like these guys really came in not really having an opinion on volatility they're just kind of aware of it um, you're, you're, you're totally right. So. You know, it's imagine like, you know, you, you zoom into a little pond in your neighborhood and you, you zoom in close and you see two paramecium like battling with each other about, you know, a little speck of, you know, algae or whatever, right? They have no idea that there's a fish over there. And they have even less of an idea that they're in a pond or this pond is one of a thousand ponds. It's on a, you know, on a, in a state that's in an island, you know, or whatever. So you're right. So if you are a, you know, vol guy making markets in 30 different names at group one, group one, you you maybe know something about the vol surface of Tesla, but that's about it. And you know how to use the software that they've worked on over the last 20 years, but why is Tesla going up or why is, why are bonds going down? You have no idea. Yep. And it doesn't scale. Which is, why, right? which is why, by the way, parenthetically, why so many of those guys, uh, again, won't drop any names, but have been selling income courses and income calendar in triple income calendars since 2001. No bullshit. Like they left the SIBO floor, were backed either by Group One or some of the other larger firms down there on the SIBO floor, and then they just pivoted to options income education. Um, and that's their new business. I mean, you can't knock the hustle. It is what it is, but like right. they didn't go prop for a reason, you know? Well, I mean, Group One is a prop firm. The, the problem with the hedge fund world is that. In some ways, it's more sophisticated. In other ways, it's less sophisticated. But the, the main problem is, how does it scale? Because if, if you're out there making markets in 30 Delta puts in Tesla, I mean, you can't do that with a billion dollars. You know, you can barely do that with 10 million. That's about yeah. it. You know, and by the time you actually lever up these, you know, $2 options, you go out by 2,000 of them, the market figures out who you are and they fade you, as they should. Yeah, that's true. So part of that, before I get to almost the flip side of like, what's it like owning one of these firms and, and thinking about the way you did with like aggregating a lot of capacity constraint strategies, let's just say like uh, hypothetically you had a, uh, a prop trader that's been trading out of their own house or we work or something like that. And they, they're running like single digit millions and maybe their capacity is maybe, you know, 10 to 20 million, somewhere in that range. And they've been having a great P&L. But as you know, if you're doing that, your P&L is also attributed to like your, your personal life and everything. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. You can't be 
um, as unemotional about it. Like, what are the kind of pros and cons to going to work at a prop shop? Like, wh- is, it a, is it a good idea? So that person just keep running their own book? You know, maybe it's not even a, a good idea for them to go to a prop shop. Um, depends on the pay, on the pay, right? And depends on the scale. Yeah. So I mean, if, if, you're, if you're running a, a $100,000 strategy and you know you can scale, you know, 1,000x, then yeah, sure. Um, but if you're, you know, you're trading something quirky like soybeans at three in the morning, you know, they can, they can give you $5 million, but you might make a million or two and then you get your, your cut. So maybe it's not that great. And, you know, that is true, especially within the futures world. A lot of guys have great P&Ls and their sharp is really strong, but they just don't scale. Yep. I mean, if you actually have real big boy money, right. you, you, you can't put it to work. So you, you blow them out so fast that they don't even know what to do about it. So there are a lot of problems that with that, but I mean, ultimately it boils down to, you know, what is your strategy? Does it scale? And, you know, does it scale at this, the terms of the deal? And only the individual can make that decision. But what kind of scale would you be looking for? Like, do you, are you fine with something that's like sub 20 million in capacity because you can combine it sure. with your hundred other guys? Is this fine by you? Yeah, totally. So, you know, if, if you have, you know, a guy that's trading Exxon, another guy that's trading Chevron, and they don't know how the other two work, you know, you can cross collateralize, collateralize those ideas. Or if you're in the futures business, so you only need to put up a certain amount of maintenance margin. And then you can, you know, you can put your gold guy against your beans guy against your, you know, your inf- fixed income guy. And, you know, you actually may, maybe need to have, you know, $10 million on deposit at the firm, but you are actually controlling something like $100 million or maybe a little bit more. So those are all very realistic things that you can do. And you can do it less so within the equity space, specifically equity options, because, you know, the the, the risk limits are going to be different. Assuming you, you have a prime relationship someplace real like Goldman or ABN where they give you know, real, real margining, um, the methodology is known. And yeah, it could be totally worth it to you. That was uh, actually just front, front ran where I was almost headed next, which is perfect. But also before we get there, though, you, do, you also reference like the trader can make their cut from the prop firm. Just like ballpark, what's like an average cut? Is it just uh, a percentage of, of incentive? Is that, in, I mean, is a baseline salary plus incentive? Like, I'm sure it's kind of run the full gamut, but give us an idea, like color around, like what is the actual yeah. even the cut going to the individual traders? So in the beginning, if you're watching this interview, I assume you don't already know most of these, qu- these questions and answers. So I'm assuming that you're a junior trader. With that assumption, um, it's going to be something like 10 or 20%. Um, it could be higher. But if it's if it's higher, that means it's a it's a smaller trade. So if you're getting stuck on you know the bond desk, which is going to be a big number desk, they're not going to give you 50% of the bond trade. There's just no way because there's billions of dollars there. So you're going to get a small little chunk. But if you know if you're on the lumber desk, which is pretty thin and you know been volatile, could you get 30, 40%? Sure, because it's a smaller trade. But and the numbers are, you know, usually low six figures to low seven figures. Is it realistic that a prop trader makes a million dollars their first year? I mean, 10%. Is it, I, is it realistic that a, a, a prop trader makes a million dollars within three years? Yes, that's quite very reasonable. Yeah, like so it's, a, it's dependent on your allocation size. And then like I'm sure as you become more and more successful, you can negotiate more of your incentive fee on the back end. But of then course. just so I know, is, is there any sort of like base, like almost minimum wage salary or is that just non-existent just so people know at like a legit firm? Yeah, I, I think that the bases are something like 150 to 250. Um, I, I know the I know that even interns at some of the good prop firms are making more than that. So, you know, I know some firms out here in California that you know starting salaries like 500. But you know these these people that are getting these jobs are not dinglings. I mean, they're very smart people. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the key thing. I mean, Jason and I have a mutual friend um, who is at one of the big, big, big funds and he has his own book and it's it's quite substantial but he's a he's a freaking mathematician from georgia tech there you go you know what i mean like he is he is out of this world smart and he'd had prop experience prior you know before getting this this now recent job so i mean these are like the brightest and best people Absolutely. I, I, I was talking to these two guys from China here in my office in California. And um, the one guy is like, you know, hey, this guy's the math champion. I'm like, of what? It's like China. I'm like, what do you mean? What city? He's like, no, China. <laughs> I'm like the whole, the whole place? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that's pretty hard to do. I'm like, yes, that is very hard to do. To be the number one guy in math in all of China, it's no joke. That's like straight out of the big short where they had the number two guy. Was it when he was the runner-up right. or something in the, the Chinese quant? Um, right. So 
Darren, do you have any other questions on that side that you've been marinating on before I kind of almost flip it around and talk about what it's like to own a prop firm? Um, the, the only other thing I was wondering about was in your experience uh, with interviewing and then managing hundreds of traders or whatever, um, do you find that most of the guys that work out well come from the future side, futures and options, or from the equity side? I don't have an answer to that question. The answer to the question that you didn't ask is what is the what makes somebody work out? It is um, moral ambition. What I mean by that is somebody who is you know an initiative taker, somebody who does their job as best they can, and they also want to be there. So you can be moral and you can be ambitious, but you do things the right way and you demonstrate a work ethic. That's kind of a corny answer, but it's dead true. I mean, I've known guys that are much smarter than other guys, but they're kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't really want to be here. And they fail. And then you got guys that are maybe not as smart, but they're like really trying to learn everything. Those guys have a much greater uh, track record. It's amazing how you would think that like in our business, it's all about black and white P&L, but all the dynamics yep. from life still work out. Like be a nice person, work hard, show up yep. early, leave late, like, and everybody will give yep. you the benefit of the doubt and everybody wants to help you out. Like it's really that simple. Huh? It, it, it really is true. Hmm. So I was, um, the impetus actually from this was, I was actually talking to Darren. I was like, you know, have you ever thought about starting a prop shop? So let's kind of talk about that other side of like, what would it look like to start a prop shop? Like what you initially just talked about earlier that I think is one of the most fascinating things is like if you have the proper uh, relationships that you can actually run, you know, you can cross marginalize and run a lot more capital. And that's the point of the prop shop is it kind of almost set up like in a way I think about it, like when you want to start a bank, you get a bunch of people to put in equity in the bank. And then obviously out of well, out of whole cloth, you know, banks create loans. But instead, you could get maybe a few investors together, raise 10 million bucks, but then you could be running a hundred million dollar book across, you know, multiple traders and multiple strategies. Is that like overly simplified or what would that look like from a setup process? No, I mean, no, in theory, that's, that's not too far from what, what happens. So in the future space, it, it's a double-edged sword. It is easier to do, but because it's easier to do, it's harder to make an edge. And in the option space, you know, it is, or in the equity option space, that is, it's harder but it's harder to do and it costs more money. So it's like, you know, do you want to be in the, the quirky business with all kinds of edge that nobody else does that's hard to get into? Or do you want to be in the easy business that's easy to get into, but everybody else can do it, so there's no edge? You know, and it's just kind of like common sense. So futures trading in general is, it's cheaper, it's easier, and it's easier to get into. But because of that, you know, you need very strong IP to make money. If you're going to outcompete Optiver in the future space, yeah. you need to know what you're doing. So part of that though is like, so you, you, you put a couple of million in equity and you get the right prime relationships, which are sometimes harder than people realize. And sometimes it's a certain size. Do you know if like, you know, yeah. if it's GS or ADM, they, they'll come down in size or do you think it's usually a yeah, hundred million, a hundred million in notional is usually the minimum or? No, they, they, they say that, but that's not true. Uh, I don't want to get Goldman to yell at me because I have a relationship with Goldman, <laughs> but you know, um, the number is lower. And if you're a real person, they'll come down. So let's just say hypothetically, uh, and I'm using the air quotes here for those listening again, is like if somebody like Darren or I wanted to start like a prop shop and let's say we aggregate five to 10 million bucks in cash and then you're running at like 25 to 50 million, let's just say across the entire book. How would you then, you know, in the modern times is very different from Chicago physical space, maybe back in the day where now you could probably source people from around the world online. And but then how do you start to how would you think about getting the first people in and do you think about you want a diversification of strategies to make sure like you're not blowing up because you are running that notional leverage across your book? Yes. So uh, kind of like what you do with mutiny is, is very sensible. And you know, I've, I've talked about this privately, um, you know, how, where you got to where you are and where I've got to where I am, you know, the, the paths are very different, but the end game is not that different. So we're looking for non-correlated strategies that make money all the time, no matter what. And ideally you have 10 strategies, 10 make money. You know, more realistically, you have five strategies that go up, five strategies that go down, and the correlation is fairly low and they make money in aggregate most of the time. Um, but in terms of how do you find that, you have to have the, um, you know, it doesn't require that much mathematical heft, but you have to know how to, you know, figure out what's related to what and how those relationships change with time. So, you know, it's, you know, the correlations aren't static, right? They're dynamic and they're spurious. So you need to know that and how they change and when they'll be at the highest pain inflection point. And that's, I guess, probably the, 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 the easiest 
thing to do. But getting these relationships, as you pointed out, you know, if you just walk into Goldman Sachs and say, great, I'm here with my $5 million. Can I have an account, please? They'll say no. But, you know, if, if you can convince them that you're going to make them, you know, a couple hundred grand a year, no less, make them, not you. I mean, a couple hundred grand a year doesn't sound like much, but when you're paying out 9, 10, 11, 12 grand a month in fees, and you're like, oh, man, this kind of sucks. It adds up. And yeah, if they don't does. care. That their business is their business, not yours. It, it made me think about it in a different way because, like, I, I asked you the question earlier, Noel, that, like, you know, what do you do if you don't have any relationships? And you answered that perfectly, like, via this podcast, LinkedIn, that hustle, right? You just need some sort of wedge. And yeah. the same thing has happened to me even, like, so I can't even deny it on, like, if you want to find a good prime, like Goldman or whoever, it's like, you just start hustling relationships and yes. over time you can, and then, like you said, you look for what's their incentive. How do I talk to them in the right way? You're going to get turned down a lot of times, but just even like back in the day when I used to talk to bankers for commercial real estate, I would get, I got turned down probably 35 times before I got my initial commercial real estate development loan. Mm -hmm. And every time after they would turn me down, I go, Hey, I'm about to go across the street to this other bank. You know, what did I do wrong? Help me like improve my pitch. You know, what can there I do differently? And they were always more than happy to help. And so it's, it's, it's kind of like there, it's like, everybody's like, well, I don't know where to start. And it's like, you just need that first wedge and then you just hustle your way into it in, in a way. But like, so when you're, when you were looking at traders, what, did you, well, hold on, hold on, Jason, I don't, Jason, ahead, I don't mean to interject, but I just, there's, Please. there's something that's sort of implied here that I think we shouldn't just gloss over. Yeah. You have to have acquired the back office and compliance knowledge from some about how prime relationships work how cross margining works, how sub accounts work. In other words, there's a regulatory nuts and bolts piece that the person going into this is assumed to have, not in addition to the cash or the capital, right? Like, and so when you talk about issues of, okay, where do I start? Well, again, it's kind of like I always say, like it's knowing the end at the beginning, like you would have to have, you would have to know what you need to know in order to even get your, your organizational um, structure correct right because like what if you what if you're a guy and you and you know you whatever you cash out of crypto and you have 20 or 30 million dollars but if you don't know that you need a certain prime relationship and then there needs to be a certain amount put up for a haircut and then the other f portion or remaining capital needs to be kept at a specific type of bank right like there's all these different steps that people need to get familiar with and again this is why to Noel's point um apprenticeships internships you know doing admin stuff at one of these firms is valuable it's primarily for the business hygiene 101 stuff spot on i think I you're totally right I yeah yeah i couldn't agree more with what you're saying but you also know my history too is like i didn't have any of those relationships i didn't have any of that apprenticeship and mentorship and what i do i just started picking up the phone and asking a lot of dumb questions to a lot of people who told me would like go kick rocks and i was like wait wait before you hang up Tell me that and like, and then eventually you start putting those pieces of the puzzle together. So it is doable. It's just, it's going to take you a long time and you're going to have a lot of, um, you know, like false starts and you're going to go down a lot of blind alleys and you're going to turn around and everything. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're getting the information here from this podcast. You Google, you, you start calling people, you start asking mm -hmm. questions and you just can't be afraid of getting your door slammed in your face and told you're an idiot. Right. I mean, that's, that's so, what it boils down to. You're, you're both totally right. You know, there's, there's the business of the business and then there's the trade, right? Right. So that, that's why I have a COO, Brian, and you know, his job is to make sure that the business has you know, followed up on whatever items of business you need to do. So to Darren's point, you, know, you need to figure out all the stuff you don't know. And if you can't get an account at Goldman, you don't. You go to interactive brokers or you go to Wedbush or you go to one of the, the smaller prime brokers and then you figure out where are they jamming me on fees? Where are they negotiable on fees? Uh, what does it mean to me? And then after you do that for some period of time and you have a, maybe a bigger, better account, then you can walk into a Morgan Stanley or Goldman and say, hey, I've, I've had an account at Wedbush for the last three years. You know, Bob over at Wedbush thinks I'm a good guy. Can I have an account here too, please? Thank you. And then to your earlier point, Jason, you know, how do you start? I mean, I remember I, I, at, at, you know, in like 2000, I wanted an account at Smith Barney. I wanted a relationship with Smith Barney. I didn't have, I didn't have an account. This is before Smith Barney went away. And I remember walking up to the guy on the floor of the American Stock Exchange. I'm like, hey, I'm Noel Smith. You know, hi, Joe. Nice to meet you. Uh, I want to, you know, I want to look at some of your flow. I want to look at some of your flow business. He's like, get out of here. I don't know you. And uh, he just completely blew me off. I'm like, I don't, I don't expect anything from you. Uh, this is what I'll tell you. I'll give you deep and liquid markets. I won't take up your time. And then I'll give you good fills. And I did that. And I, I traded with him for Theo for like a year. 
And, you know, it was a very grudging relationship. He did not want to build it because he already had relationships. But it's kind of like a drug dealer analogy, right? Do you want to be able to sell, you know, small quantities of drugs to a thousand people or do you want to sell a gigantic pile of drugs to one guy one time for a good price? Just a lot easier. Everybody is inherently lazy. Everybody wants to do the least amount of work for the most amount of money. And if you can convince somebody that you will make their life easier and more profitable, you can do business. No, that's that's perfect too. It's not even like because I, I know this exact experience is like not you know second or third tier, you know uh, prime brokers, and they're not the second or third tier. But like that's where you start because they're willing to take on smaller business because they're not Goldman. And then you start finding out how everything works that way. And then you start asking the people that work with Goldman for any sort of referrals or anything like that. And then Goldman, almost like you just said earlier with the initial traders, like anybody that's work, willing to work hard and show they're willing to put in the effort every day, then you're going to try to help them, right? And so if you start a smaller fund at like a, let's call it a second tier, even though there's not tiers, like uh, Prime, then you, you've shown you built a fund, right? So then when you go to talk to Goldman, right. you're like, look, here's my fund. Here's my track record. I'm not just yes. asking you for a hope and a dream. Here's tangible evidence that I know how to build a firm. And then the doors open where all of a sudden the, the notional 100 million can come down to maybe 25 to 50 because you've, you've proven that you're somebody that's going to go out and be an earner. Yes. And you won't make embarrass them by being outside of compliance right. or whatever else. You're not going to want to follow right. the regulators. You're going to be a play within the paint guy. They want, they want to know that too. They don't want to get in trouble because you, they don't want you to, you, your presence to add to their worry list. <laughs> you want to make their life easy, not hard. I was just, I was just thinking that, uh, uh, oh. go ahead, Darren, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to ask about uh, counterparty risk. Um, do you, I would think that you would want at least two primes, right? Like just because in the event that a Lehman happens, or like I had a buddy who started a small CTA. He started with, uh, it was about 10 million and he just had horrible luck and uh, MF Global happened. Mm -hmm. And he ended up getting 80 cents on the dollar of his of his uh, SMA money and pooled money back. That's pretty good. But that was three years later. Right. Yeah. And he never really recovered from it. I mean, he got most he was able to get back into like the high seven figures but he was never able to build into a chesapeake or a dunn or any of the other big names he's a young guy i mean he's our age you know and uh but that was devastating to him it was just bad luck and he didn't do anything wrong his compliance his audits everything was on point it was just um really horrible horrible luck and so like how do you deal with that as a prop owner or even Jason, so, in your case, like a fund of. That, that's just a hard, cold fact of life, man. Sometimes it's just luck. Some people are lucky. Some people just slip in on a banana peel and fall. Um, I don't know anybody that knew MF Global was going to happen. Um, I had an account with Bear. I had an account with Lehman. We got out. Um, but, you know, if I, my account at Goldman goes to zero tomorrow, I don't know what to tell you other than, man, I don't know what to say. I mean, these mm -hmm. you're the last person they're going to tell. So unless you hear it through the grapevine, they're not going to tell the people that have money in their, you know, vault. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So they're going to do everything they can to hide that information. I, I, I had an account at a, a, uh, a futures account at this firm, and I didn't find out until a year after the fact that they were pretty close to blowing out after Volmageddon in 2018. I didn't know that. They never told me. I found out through completely circuitous routes. But Darren, to answer your question, like the way I think about it is it, it kind of makes it a pain in the ass, but you have to worry about these things, especially if you think about the world in a long vol sense is like, you know, we have multiple FCMs, mul uh, kind of multiple primes in a way that kind of do gives ups between each other. So you're trying to diversify that way. I'm also kind of even though I prefer the liquidity of SMAs on exchange and, and diversifying my FCMs that way, I still will take a few funds off those centralized exchange that are maybe like clearing a Goldman or whoever else too, because like it's adding more diversification there. And then you have to think about with your actual bank where you keep most of the cash, you know, are you buying T-bills? You know, where's your segregated gold? Mm -hmm. You need to like constantly right. like it, but it, it, Darren, you've been an entrepreneur your whole life too. It's like, this is all entrepreneurial risk, right? You're always worried yes. about somebody's going to screw you in some way. So you're like, and to, so no one almost has a point. It's like, there's a bit of a luck to it. I mean, you try to diversify your diversifiers. You try to hedge as much risk as possible. But, you know, there is some luck. There's some luck involved. And, you know, a lot of times like your, your friend did, you can recoup the money, but it might be locked up for two to three years. 
and and time is just as valuable as money and that's the really hard part sometimes and then what happens is the the exchanges will tell you and the fcm's like we changed a lot since mf global and it's like yeah you did because they <laughs> yeah. figured out how to screw you but the next person that's going to screw you is not going to do it the same way as mf global did and so like right. that's the risk like the, it's it's always they're fighting the last battle and so you have to like think about yeah like how do you diversify across fcms across exchanges across banks across you know all your different service providers and it, it creates all these like uh kind of you know this this rat's nest of redundancy that's kind of like annoying but like if you want to you know try to be as robust as you can you know that's part of the situation i guess ultimately you don't know um i was talking earlier today about enron i mean enron was audited by a big six firm they were the ninth largest market cap in the country they went to zero you know who knew i mean like five guys knew right everyone else is like maybe i don't know but I'm not trying to say don't do your homework, but I'm just saying like, you know, you could spend a full-time job just doing homework and not even focus on the 99,000 other things you have to do. All you can do is what Jason said, diversify it and, you know, try to get the best information you can. But ultimately, if people want to lie to you, they're going to lie. Yeah, it's usually people like falsifying brokerage statements. I mean, just outright fraud. That's like stuff that's yeah. really hard to even catch. That's just insane um, that I've seen numerous cases of, and I'm sure Noel has seen it as, as well. Um, part of it, I was wondering, like, no, like I was just thinking out loud to myself or in my in the voices in my head is like besides even starting up a, a prop shop, have you ever seen almost and I'm sure you have is like almost a bunch of individual prop traders almost getting together um, so they could create a little superhero group where they are able to cross margin at maybe the prime and then they're able to diversify. So if like I'm somebody that's trading one very specific like option strategy on SPX and I kind of know where my weak points are. Does it behoove me to try to find four or five other guys or girls that are trading, you know, uncorrelated strategies to me so I can actually diversify my own personal P&L risk, you know, as I'm trying to, you know, eat what I kill? I mean, if you want to be the traveling Wilburys of, you know, finance, then sure. Um, so totally yes is the answer. But realistically, you probably don't know a rock star in gold, a rock star in bonds, a rock star in corn, a rock star in, you know, mortgages and CDS. Just the idea that you would know all these people and they would all be off their non-competes and they're all wanting to quit their multi seven figure jobs at the same time. It's tough to assemble that, you know, you know, unless you are literally like a Ken Griffin type where you can just start anew if you really wanted to. Um, it's really tough to do. So realistically, most prop firms that I know of that have been started, you know, are just two dudes that are buddies that also have some money and they figure it out and they both trade the, probably mostly the same thing or somewhat the same thing. And then you figure it out. That's more realistic. Like, yeah. Also, Jason, like I was just, th I was thinking with your question, right? Like, um, most profitable traders, like Noel was describing, know guys who trade similarly to them, right? So, like, if you're a vol guy and you're in equities and you deal with small caps, you tend to know people who tend to trade around that same edge, right? Like, that's who you tend to fraternize with and hang out with and talk to, whether even if it's virtually knowing somebody all the way on the other end of the spectrum who let's say is a rock star in that gas or whatever like that's that actually that's probably not that common it's not it's very rare actually and it's funny how how many people i know that only know guys that are net gas guys or only know guys that are whatever guys that's very normal so you know you're on a desk with a handful of other people you guys all gossip about the same stories about whatever but the chance you're knowing about somebody that's in cds and that's all they do and unless you have a reason to know them, you probably don't. Yeah, part of it's like I always had a problem when like reading Market Wizards, like all these trend followers and everything that have these divergent strategies. And you're like, where do you guys get hurt? Oh, and in mean reversion or conversion strategies. I'm like, well, go make fun, make friends with a with a mean reversion trader. And then you have a better P&L. But like nobody wants to do that, like you guys are saying. But like maybe you no know, thinking out loud is like is maybe the way to do that is almost start like an uh an exempt CPO of less than like 15 participants. And then that's how you can mm -hmm. find the other traders and allocate capital to them to diversify now, your PL. If you're doing a CPO, then you also have money and other stuff. So it's, you have to comply within those percentages as well. So that I think would be you know, cumbersome just from a compliance standpoint. Um, I think it would be simpler to just, you know, you assemble a small team of people, assuming you have some level of capital. And what you right. do is you do your best to make a PL, you have it verified. Um, to any preponderance of a doubt, because anybody who, if you come to me and you say, Hey, I, I want, I'm a net gas trader and I want to, I want you to give me money. I will hammer you on your P and L there's I, the, the bar to convince me that you're going to make me money is high, but I'm convincible. 
you know, and I, I got to believe everybody, every other firm would be the same way. I mean, if you just figure out how to convince me, then we can probably do some business. Um, but you're going to have to super duper show with, you know, everything and everything. You got to take your pants down and let's say, ah, because that's how it's going to have to be. <laughs> well, let's start with the, like, how, how long, how long, just auditors. real quick, how long, how long does the track record need to be for, well, that's for a good you? Question. Yeah. Depends. So it, it, it'll depend on the environment. So, um, you know, stocks are down right now, right? But they've been up for a long time. So how do you trade vol in 2022 versus how do you trade vol in 2017? Did they might as well be net gas and gold because they're totally different. So if you want to demonstrate mastery of a marketplace, you have to have some time. Um, if you just like, yeah, I've been selling puts and it's 2017. I'm up 27%. All I do is sell puts. Well, that's easy because all the, the market has done nothing, right? And your puts have died every day and you're a hero. But then we go into 2018. Now you're dead 50 times over. So I don't know. Are you a good trader or are you a lucky trader? That's the job on my end to figure out if you are a good trader or you're just lucky for a little while. And then obviously it matters like frequency of trades and everything too for you to get more statistical significance. And yes. what I was asking too is like, what, um, what, who would you respect to, to run the audited track record? Like if somebody want to bring a track record, who should they think about getting it audited by that you would then say, oh, this is at least semi-legit. And then that, that keeps the conversation open. Um, you know, I used my, my first real accounting firm was Grant Thornton, and they were very on, above, above you know, board. They were totally fine. Um, it's got to be somebody that's Googleable. It can't be the, you know, the CPA down the street. Um, you've got to spend probably no less than five grand in, a re, in an audit. I mean, an audit from a big six firm is going to be you know, 30, 40 grand on the very light side. Um, but if you're not spending at least five grand for an audit, I just can't imagine the results are going to be taken seriously. I mean, yeah, you can't be Bernie Madoff using somebody in upstate New York in a single family office. Exactly. <laughs> like, um, part exactly. of that, like you just said, is like, I right, have an audited track record, right? And then um, depending on your strategy, you'll know like frequency, but also from your experience, you know, like different trading environments, what it did well and when it didn't do well. What are other, some of those other like initial filters? Like what would you look at initially? Are you looking at like Sharp, Sortino, Skew, Kurtosis, or really just strategy dependent? Sharp ratios can be, can be a very misleading. A Sortino ratio is better, but you know, other than, you know, so you, I guess you look at it, right? You know, like the basics, um, but yeah, yeah um, I don't even know what my Sharp ratio was for, you know, 15 years or more uh, because it didn't matter. Um, the volatility of my P&L was high, so my Sharp ratio was probably low. But the PL was good, so who cares? Who cares if you have a you know a 0.01 sharp, but you made a billion dollars? Great. Um, so I think you look at all of those things at first glance. But if you if you are qualified to hire somebody, I would hope that you would know those things ahead of time. And, you know your your B your BS nose gets really you know really good, right? You, you're able to sniff out nonsense pretty easily. Do prop firms prefer people that run a higher ball though, because of like you're you're making yes. a lot of bets spread across the aggregate, so it's, you actually are looking for people that are running more capital efficient higher ball strategies? I said yes, but it's not really true. You don't necessarily prefer somebody who's higher vol, but higher vol is usually accompanied by higher PL. Not necessarily, but often. So high vol isn't into itself good, but high PL is good and high vol why? What was the extraneous circumstance? Why were you down 50% last Tuesday? Okay, well, so were we. So I understand that. So that's what you try to, that, that as a hirer, the back or, that's what you have to figure out. And if you have like 100 prop traders, what kind of tech stack are you looking at? Or is there a way to like almost like piggyback like the SMA tech as well? Or like, what did you have to, did you have to build out proprietary stuff as a firm? Or like what, what yeah. kind of, what did it look like? So, this is a this is like you know a, a golden age of uh, of trading and for like filmmaking. You know you can do more with an iPhone that you couldn't do with a fifty thousand dollar camera ten years ago. You can do more with a prop firm that you couldn't do with a hundred million dollars you know fifteen years ago. So you know high frequency trading has become commoditized. First off, you have to figure out your time slice. Are you high frequency, mid frequency, low latency? You know wh where are you and what do you need for technology? If you really want to compete with Optiver or Citadel, good luck to you. It ain't gonna happen. Because these guys are spending, you know, two hundred billion dollars a year in nothing but ways to crush you, and so unless that's your budget, and not just two hundred million dollars, but two hundred million dollars, and the guys that are spinning the dials are the best guys in the market, so they know what they're doing. Um, so you can buy some of that stuff, but then you have to know how to use it. You know, I can give you a guitar, but that doesn't mean you're Jimmy Page. Um, you got a guitar, but you ain't Jimmy Page, um, and it's a, kind of the same thing. You know, you can. Uh, I use professional level software. Some people probably would do better. Some people would maybe do worse. 
Um, but I, I use it, I purchase it. Some of the stuff that is available, you can, that most of the stuff that we used to have to build, you can now buy. And if you think about it, the reason is simple because the guys that built it in-house went and got a job or started their own company. Think about it, you know? So if you started Susquehanna 30 years ago, the guy that built your vol models, or maybe one of the guys that built your, built your vol models, he got bored, got, got fired, quit, whatever. And now he runs a, a vol modeling shop that will sell you his, his Theos. And now that is a lot cheaper than bringing in six guys to all figure out how to build your own vol model. So you can parse this stuff off the rack pretty easily. You know, it's like, it's like a good bicycle. You know, the frame is the, is, the, is the main part, but you buy the fork, the cranks, the chain, and the handlebars from other people. But if you have the frame and you have your own unique IP on the frame, you can actually have a good product. You don't need to invent the whole wheel is what I'm saying. Yeah, and Jason, also, man, like on the even on the retail front, on the higher end of retail, some of the analytic uh, enterprise offerings for for vol modeling, scans, um, not as much on the risk management stress test side. That's still more institutional, but man, you can get some damn good stuff um, for a, a moderate price for high end retail now, man. I mean, some of these offerings, I mean. Because they're selling a product, some of the marketing can be kind of cheesy and you may not like it. Like I'm thinking about right now, um, Market Chameleon, who you and actually introduced me to. And like some of their marketing and their branding is kind of like, ah, is this Tasty Trade Light or whatever it is. But then when you actually use the product, like I've been using it for a month and a half now. And it's sophisticated. It's impressive. I mean, it gets you into all the ideas that you would try to build yourself through Python or R or the combination of the two or C++ or whatever. Um, but it's just a lot cheaper. It's more affordable to, to do it that way. So I, I can only imagine on the institutional side, um, the, I mean, you know, like Noel said, you can, you can pretty much just piecemeal that together with uh, commercial offerings. Like no well, if you I think it's, go ahead, I was gonna, I was gonna say like to highlight some of the things you said is like people don't realize that not even necessarily the high frequency trading firms, the market maker high frequency traders, they are spending 150 to 200 million a year down the drain just on the tech side, and even like the ones that aren't even aren't even competing that quickly, like the pod shops like Valley Asney, if I recall correctly, I think they have 150 people on their tech team alone. So like mm -hmm. that's that kind of like we're up against. But I'm wondering like also, uh, no, you want to say something before I ask Darren a question? Sorry. But I was going to just use an example from, from my life, which is, you know, if, if you are hiring enough PGA engineer or you're, you're fabbing an ASIC, let's think about, you know, what is an ASIC? Well, it's a, it's a thing that does a thing, right? So you have to figure out how to architect this thing. You have to figure out the exact proportion of metals within or in the alloys for the superconductors or the semiconductors. You have to figure out the space between the circuits. You have, to, you, have to, you have to fab all this stuff virtually, and then you send it to Taiwan, spend $5 million and get it back in two years, and maybe it works. If you can afford to do that 50 times over, you can run a prop firm. But it is very hard. <laughs> I was just watching Darren's face. For those of you who listened to the audio, it's like, really good. But Darren, besides like bricolaging together maybe these um, different platforms that you can use as, as, a, as a DIY prop trader, what else are like, what are your usual sticky points? Is it finding like even good, you know, prime relationships so you can get better, get better commission rates? Like, what do you think that like the quote unquote pros have over like a, a DIY prop trader, like in, in your estimation? Um, I think the advantage that they have is, so it's funny. I had a long conversation with, uh, I call him Egyptian Chris or whatever, but we talked a lot about this. And one of the things that he gave me insights on in his time at, at SIG was that he was able to like, from his desk basically just subscribe to like a phenomenal data feed, right? Of, of, of all kinds of amalgamations of like realized vol calculations that he would then incorporate to make his markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's that type of stuff that as an independent person to have that just outsourced to a, a team of devs of like 25 people. And all I have to do is pay a monthly subscription fee that's added on to my desk fee. That's a huge advantage over somebody like me who like one of the reasons why my days are so chaotic is because almost everything I've either purchased the offering, but it's still limited in terms of like risk analytics. So I have to do that myself and it's a very discretionary process. So it's really impossible 
for it to be efficient, especially when trading options, right? Like it's just it. I wish I could be more streamlined, but to be quite honest, Jason, like I just don't have the resources to compete with prop guys. Where it's it's like the equivalent of a guy who has all of his team supporting him, like a whole team of people supporting him, and I just can't compete with that. So a lot of the things that I do are much more inefficient in terms of time and and, and return on my time as opposed to somebody who's a prop guy. I mean, they get, I mean, it, it's amazing talking to Chris, like all the stuff he had, like at his disposal. Essentially, Chris's job was to be a really good decision maker and, a really, and use his discretion and his experience to sort of to apply these really impressive weapons. Right. Like that's all Chris's job was just to be a really solid decision maker under a level of uncertainty and to have really robust and strong relationships with um, brokers, with four guys, with with the independent guys that were on the Merck floor. Like he would have relationships with those guys and understand what they needed to do. And if there were times where he needed to, you know, buy something under Theo or sell something under Theo or whatever have you, they would work with him. So like there was a people component and then there was an applied data component. And when you merge the two, I mean, it's bionic, man, as opposed to me, like, dude, I'm just, but the, so the, not to always, just not to just disparage myself, but the advantage that I have though, is I don't try to compete on time or speed, but I have the space to be able to really dig deep particularly on like single stock stuff. And I can really dig deep and really do the research and look at the vol servers, double and triple check, and then put on really positive EB trades that they can't. Like, to be honest with you, I don't even think a lot of those guys that made those markets, they even know how to do that because that's not their game. So I stick to what works for me as an independent high-end retail person. And I don't even try to compete on those terms, but I can't sit here and lie to you and say that. Like, I'm not hella jealous. When I talk to Egyptian Chris or Sidio, and they tell me about all the stuff that they had going on at Prop, and I'm like, "Damn, that sounds sweet, man. That's like F1 racing, right? Just you're the driver, yeah. and your job is to drive it as best as you can. But you have like the best engineers from freaking France and Germany yeah. and all these places at your disposal on a daily basis." Yeah, I, I think you're totally right, and I think that you know you could be the single best driver on the planet. But you're not going to beat a McLaren or Ferrari or, you know, whatever, you know, because they're just they have a whole army of dudes that do nothing but try to figure out how to shave microseconds. So it's just not possible. Then once you just figure out you can you can participate in the in the motorsport, but you can just do it in a different way. Then you don't have to beat yourself up over that because you're not going to beat them. You're not going to beat Susquehanna or Citadel or Optiver to market. They will take the first trade, but that doesn't mean it's the best trade because they do all kinds right. of losing trades. So that what you can do is exactly what you just said. You can take it from a different angle. You can look at it differently. You can use different data sets. And you're right. Those guys that are, you know, looking at the vol surface and maybe, you know, you know, making markets and adjusting their skews a little bit, they don't, they don't know where the stock's going to go. Um, and, and they might not even really care because that's not their gig. So they try to look at it from a totally different level. Like those two paramecium in our pond, right? They worry about paramecium stuff. They're not worried about hydra stuff or amoeba stuff. They're certainly not worried about fish stuff. So as a macro guy, you might be a fish or, you know, you might be the pond if you're even a bigger macro guy, but you're never going to win the paramecium game if that's what you're trying to do. What, no, I was just thinking about what, this may be a twofold question. It's like, what is actually the difference between a, a pod shop like Baliazny and Millennium versus a prop shop? And maybe if you are running a prop shop and you have really good um, prop traders or like, what's your value add? Like Darren was saying is like, is it that I can provide the tech stack for you that you can rent from me or it comes out of your PL and that that's the, the real value add for, for DIY or prop traders to come under a prop shop umbrella. Whereas typically at the pod shops, it was like, it was for a lot of people that didn't want to go out and raise assets. Cause as we know, that's the most time consuming and, and mind numbing part of the business. But is that yeah. the primary difference between what's the difference between like pod and prop kind of within that structure? Then you pretty much got it right. So if you want to go work at a prop firm, you're going to have a commission structure that's usually better, whether it be a 106J at the CME or some kind of agreement where you're paying two cents an option at Goldman, um, as opposed to, you know, I think 60 cents at interactive brokers or something like that. Um, so there's a huge difference right there. Um, your, your ability to get to market will, will be better. But, you know, in terms of the IP, 
it's probably not that different. You know, if you know how to trade beans versus hogs, fine. Then you're the beans hogs guy. Um, you can do that at Ballyazny, or you can do that at you know Susquehanna. Um, but the the tech stack will be different. It'll probably be worse at the hedge fund because they usually just don't care as much. And there's a hundred of you. And if you go down three percent, they're going to cut your allocation. If you go down six percent, you're fired. Um, versus the prop firm is going to be probably a lot more forgiving, but also a lot more involved in what you're doing. Because there's not a hundred of you. Maybe there's four of you. You know, and they're trying to figure out how to massage that trade. So if you can scale, you're probably better off at a pod. If you can't, you're probably better off at a prop firm. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, because if you, if you can run uh, fixed income in billions of dollars, then you need that, that economy yes. of scale, that ballet as near millennium. That's your edge, right? Your edge yeah. is that you buy 40,000 homes at one time, not one super good house that you can fix up, right? right. I'm going to yeah. buy... Half of West Texas, that's my edge. Like, cause nobody else has that kind of loot. That's your edge. And that's a totally different thing, right? So if you have, like you said, if you have a giant number that you can move, the barriers to entry are higher because the, the product you're working in is different. That's why, that's why they went from spoos to e-minis and now micros. Because in order to be in the spoo game, you had to have a lot of money. And then nobody could trade them. So that's why they developed the e-mini and now the, the e-micros. And I, Darren, I forgot for a second that Noel's the king of the analogy and metaphor, but he just keeps throwing out these zingers every time. It's, right. it's always amazing. Noel, do you think that in, in 2022, what would be the pros and cons? Or like, do you think you could run an actual virtual prop shop and people could be all over the world? Or do you prefer that like all your traders are in one room so it's a little bit better oversight and a little bit better education? Like, what would be the pros and cons there? And is it possible? So, to you know, it's, it's like saying, you know, hey, can you have 10 girlfriends at once? I mean, maybe, right? Not so easy in real life. Um, in real life, if you have you know, 10 traders doing 10 different things, you have to deal with the vicissitudes of their personalities, their work ethic, and everything else. And that's just, again, one of the hard cold facts of life. But if you have 10 hard-charging individuals that are good at their job and always knock out their business, yeah, sure, it can be done. But Jason, so I want to interject on that really quick. Please. You should actually answer your own question because you and your partner, Taylor, are – some of the best people that I've ever met in my life um, at creating a culture virtually. Because I will tell you, as, as like you said, I've been an entrepreneur since the beginning, since 20s, since my 20s. Um, that is one of the hardest aspects of entrepreneurship is management and establishing a culture. And to be honest, this is the one thing that um, I don't want to call them bucket shops, but the particular firm that I'm thinking of out of New York, um, that they do really well. They have names for all their traders. They have really good marketing. Um, their online uh, short video clips are are somewhat informative if you're like a gym equity day trading type. Um, but the editing is really good. The camera work is great. Um, and people see that to the point where the individuals with their monikers or or pet names right like or their nicknames people know them right so it's like wow like they were able to create a culture let you see it kind of almost through a case study method and then people are envious of that people are like yo like i want to send in my application or here's my track record or i have this automated system can your system team evaluate maybe i can get you know now Granted, most of those people never even get a shot. They have to pay for the education package, but they're re they're so good at that brand building, that team building, that culture. And I think that is really, really, really hard. But I'd be curious to hear you talk about how to do that. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words, uh, but if, uh, if we're upfront about it, it's actually all Taylor. Uh, my partner, Taylor Pearson, is like he's been... Um, in trying to run virtual companies from uh, with virtual assistants from all over the world for the better part of a decade and a half now. So he's thought about it like, uh, you know, for all going on 15 years and how do you build out that culture? How do you build that team? And, and like anything in life, he's probably learned it all through mistakes, right? But he's just had a lot of experience with the mistakes and how do you build that culture? And there's a lot of things like him and I always discussed where he's, he's leading us as, as far as like the amount of communication, right? You have to a lot of the times over communicate more than you realize and, and realize a lot of times that things get lost in translation and things get lost in text. So it is, it's, it's really difficult to build that culture, um, but it can be done. But like you, there's maybe a handful of, of people in the world that have experience 
with building that culture for the past decade. So they know like what's kind of works and what doesn't work. And so, but anybody can figure it out. They're just going to go out and make mm -hmm. mistakes and kind of figure it out. But I'm just wondering if there's anything, Noel, from your perspective that might be unique or idiosyncratic around trading or running a prop shop that, that like can't be done online, you think? Um, you know, we all said the same thing in different versions, which is, you know, the just enthusiasm, the desire, the ambition to be good at anything, whether it be, you know, hockey, basketball or trading options, you have got to want to learn. You've got to be reading stuff. You have to be consuming stuff. You have to put the time in. You have to make the phone calls that are a little bit embarrassing. You have to be willing to expose your ignorance. I mean, you've got to be willing to do it all. And through that times time, you know, you all of a sudden become, you know, a thought leader in your space. But, you know, there's no magic to getting in the NBA. I mean, yeah, you maybe got to be a tall guy and, you know, an athletic, but you still got to work, you know, and you got to work from an early age. It takes time. And the same thing goes for a lot of this stuff. So if someone wants to listen to a podcast and just figure out, wow, that's the secret sauce. Here we go. I'm going to buy, uh, you know, go start a prop firm tomorrow. Not that easy. You know, if you have to figure out something that makes... Oh, man, no, we lost you for just a second there. You're frozen. I've, I've lost you guys. Go. Okay, you're, you're back. We can hear you. You're right. back now. Perfect. Sorry. You were, uh, you're saying that the NBA and then you, it's not that easy. you got to go out there and... All I'm saying is that, you know, we're all saying the same thing, which is you have to do the, the work. You have to be able to... You have to be willing to scrub the toilets, make the phone calls, do the things that other people aren't willing to do. That's why you're successful. And, you know, when, when everyone else is home or, you know, you know, I worked with this guy. We started the same job out of college. We were roommates. And I started pulling away from him um, in terms of our income. And he's like, he came to me kind of hat in hand one day. He's like, you know, what's going on, man? You know, how come you're making money and I'm not? I'm like, bro, you show up. I'm already there. When you leave, I'm still there. There's no magic to this. And I wasn't even being a jackass to the guy. I was being sincere. I'm like, you have to work harder. And when I'm at the office, I'm not talking to my girlfriend. I'm talking to people. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do some gross over here. And that, that's, that's the message, which is you have to come up with something unique. You have to figure out the processes. And it, if you're a nice person, you will exude that and people will be willing to help you. You know, if you're like, Hey man, I don't know what's going on. You know, how do I get into, how do I get an account at Wedbush? Yeah, I know Joe Jones at Wedbush. I'll, I'll tell him that you call, tell him to expect your call on Tuesday. Cool. Now you're in at Wedbush and you figure something out. Now you got to do that times a thousand. Yeah, I think I think, but Jason, I think the challenge with what Noel was saying is, and this is something that I ran into. I have all the traits that he just talked about personally. With culture building in a, in an upstart business, you have to figure out a way to almost codify yourself or you and yes. your partner that start the prop firm. That's the really hard. So, like, I if I'm willing to do it, this is how you end up like, you know a lonely higher end retail trader is because you can, you can count on yourself to be willing to do all those things, but copying yourself amongst 10 other traders and what you value your work ethic carrying, like that's really, that that's hard. And then on top of that, when you think about doing it virtually, cause I think that there is a human piece like in person, when you think about the mystique and the folklore around particularly Chicago prop trading, it's it's not just the edge it's the personalities it's the camaraderie yes. it's the humor um yes. that 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 add to the mythology in the folklore or well, one guy one day this guy i i knew he was back in the minis and he had a million dollar day or whatever in 1988 or whatever it is right and you're like damn like yeah and then he went out and bought a horse or something crazy like it's <laughs> but all that fun stuff and the jokes and the camaraderie um that also is part of culture building, right? So if you yourself are, have all those those virtuous traits, that's great. But can you can you bring can you onboard people like Chick Fil A that have those same values regardless of their level in the totem pole? That's part of the job. That's the that's the crazy part. That's part of the job. Figuring out how to figure it out and how to make how to make responsible hires. That's part of it. Well, that's there's so many things you like you both said that I want to pull on. One, first of all, is uh, Darren. It's always my pleasure. You know, CFA is uh, I am a big fan of, of Chick Fil A. But part of it, like, like, and then Noel's just saying this, like, that's building any business, right? Like, business is just hard, and people don't realize, like, 
Um, just like why like 90% of restaurants fail in the first year is because somebody thinks I'm a good at home cook or I'm a good, uh, I know how to throw a good party and all their friends tell them they should go and do it, but they have like no experience and they have no idea like how hard it is. And so it, it, the business of running a, um, investment company is a business, right? That's separate from your trading P and L. And then most people miss that is like trading is the easy part of this business. The actual running the business of an investment firm is actually a lot harder than the actual trading side. And a lot of people miss that. And like you were talking about that camaraderie. It's amazing. Actually, I, I'll tell you anecdotes from watching even Noel in person, like in Miami is like those guys like Noel that have been around forever. They're all like they start congregating together and they're telling stories from 20 years ago on the floor. And they mm -hmm. got all those crazy stories that you reference. And that's also why I love Chicago versus New York is all of those great, you know, lunch pail traders that came out of Chicago. And like, you know, like you're saying, guys would buy a Porsche that day and they'd get repossessed next week. Like they, <laughs> they all get together. Yeah. They all start talking with their hands and their hand signals like they're back in the pits. So, oh, there, is, so like said, there is there is something to that camaraderie. And that's that's maybe a reason to move to Chicago or something like that. But then to your point, Darren, about, you know, building the culture of an online corporate uh, business. And this is why I shouldn't speak to it. And like Taylor's much better at this is because I'm actually learning from Taylor because I'm not so great at it because the things you reference is like I am a, a great like entrepreneur taking companies zero from one. And I just put my head down and I work. But if you're building a um, a distributed company like, you know, our assistants in South Africa, for, for example, shout out to Melanie, is like you have to be able to write down all of your thinking. You have to codify it like you were saying. And sometimes that takes a lot of time out of your day. And you're like, I don't have time for this shit, except for that helps the company go faster. For you slowing down and writing it out and codifying and us building all the SOPs and systems in place, you go just like the, the military, you go slow, you know, go slow to go fast, you know, mm -hmm. slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And so those are the parts of the process that I think a lot of people that aren't used to those kind of companies, that's the real um, sticking or friction points or learning curve is going to be codif codifying all your thinking, putting it down on paper so people can look at it asynchronistically and they can understand what you're talking about. And that's how you build the SOPs and culture over time. And then it takes time for everybody to learn that, for everybody to develop the cadence yep. and for you to build that culture. It's actually really hard to do, but just like every business, it's hard. Um, I, you know, you couldn't be more right. You're so right on that, dude. I, I was just saying, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like if you criticize an employee, some people just kind of look at their shoes and get all sad and other people get, get all fired yeah. up and they want to go hard charging back into the thing. Yeah. And other, you, know, you have to figure out how to play the play. You know, it's not always the same. So as the manager, you have to be thinking five steps ahead of the people you're talking with about what they've done right, what they've done wrong and how to best get the result that you want. That isn't easy. I don't know how you do that without experience. You have to just deal with it. Yeah, you have to know how to deal with people. Like you're saying, Darren's done other businesses. He knows how to deal with people. It's like, at the, it's always people skills at the end of the day. And, and almost like Darren, you're saying is like, okay, how do I come from out of this side of this industry? Like, how did I get to know these managers? It's like, I developed relationships with a lot of these managers three years before we ever launched our fund. You know, I was, you know, emailing them, calling them on the phone, but thinking of like good questions or value add, even though I was asking a lot of stupid questions and even going to like events in Miami long before we had a firm. And the idea was like, and selling them on their dream is like, here's what we're trying to do. But I was also just building those relationships over time. So when it came time to launch our fund, we had those relationships in place. And because of that, those managers were even able to come down on their stated minimums for who they would take it from because I developed that relationship. And like, it goes back to what Noel was saying at the beginning, people are going to give you the benefit of the doubt if you put in the time and put in the work. And I know, I know I'm not preaching to either of you two because I, I know both of your backgrounds. It's just like everything in life, right? It's just going to take the time and the sacrifice. And I was laughing, Noel, while you were saying that. I was like, how many times have all of us seen that like during on any given day, we make tons of sacrifices of spending time with our families and loved ones and everything. And during when you make those sacrifices, they're like, oh, man, that sucks. You know, they're like they're bagging on you. Like you should come spend these holidays with us. And you're like, I can't. I'm building my business. Right. And then one day, five to 10 years later, you become what people think is successful. And then they call you an overnight success. And I'm like, did you forget all those sacrifices I yeah, made that dude. you made fun of me for? That's so true. That is so true. I remember what, in college, I would, guys would go up like, hey, we're going to go out drinking. I'm like, I got to yeah. study. You know, you know why? Because I'm curving against these dudes from China that are amazing at this stuff. And they're <laughs> really smart. And I'm like, and it, I'm, I'm not even being like facetious. I'm, that's exactly what happened. I mean, I, I had to compete against really smart people. And my buddies were like out goofing off. And I'm like, I can't, you know, and that's just how it is. You, you have to make those sacrifices. You know, I know this is an, an interesting part, you know, part of it, you know, which is like work harder, be more ethical. And that's like al almost useless, but you know, yeah. it, it's, it's part of it. And you got to be willing to do that stuff. If you think you're just going to like start trading spoos and you're going to be an overnight, overnight trillionaire, then it can happen unless you're just crazy lucky. Right.
Well, we've all, all had that experience where we got crazy lucky and we thought we, we were just at the beginning stage of that until we learned we were just getting lucky. Um, but part of it is like a lot of the stuff we've been talking about is like things that through hustle and hard work and all this stuff you can learn, right? Like a lot of the different, uh, different ways we're talking about trading, how to get into a prop shop, how to run a prop shop, all of that stuff can be learned. But one of the things we danced around earlier, Noel, that I want to bring back up is like the one thing that can't be learned and there's no answer for that I think is always that I love talking to you about is the idea of correlations. Right. If you're running a prop shop and you have all these all these different strategies and you're putting together an aggregate portfolio and correlations are conditional, it's like, how do you deal with correlations? And I, I think this yeah. is the one unanswerable question. I'm not sure either of you or I have great answers for it, but I think it's something to kind of bring up and highlight as we get towards you know the end of this discussion is like the idea of like, how do you do like everything? Like you said, sharp, sortino, skew, kurtosis, all of those can be measured, but it's over what time window. But then mm -hmm. as soon as you combine it with another strategy, now you have integrative complexity. And then if you're complaining, like, I can't imagine you running 100 strategies under one shop. It's like, yeah. how do, you, do you just put them in like just gross buckets of like, this is like basically long ball, this is short ball, like kind of like, how do you even start to break down those correlations? Because as you know, they're, they're, they're spurious and they're, they're conditional. So there's no one answer. Um, well, let's use right now as an example. You know, as you know already, I've been long vol in 2022 with mediocre results. So if you told me, and I, I would, I've been long this before going into 2022, and I got out of a lot of my Delta One risk. So I'm using this as an example to demonstrate that if I did exactly what I have right now on my, on my book, any other time for the last 25 years, it's, it's printed me money. It's not really doing that great this year. Why? Because it's idiosyncratic. You know, there's, there is never always the same thing. I can give you the reasoning, and that can be a whole nother hour. I'll skip it. But bottom line is, it's always a little bit different and you have to be prepared for that. And you have to always be on the ball. Why is vol not, you know, why is the VIX not 50 right now or whatever? Cause it's not okay. We can go to the reasons, but it's not. And so love that, love that comment. <laughs> you know, it's just, you have to just deal with what's in front of you. And that's what, that's why I try to focus And Jason, you know, this on, on, on the data, you know, it should Tesla be a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars. I don't know. Tesla's are cool cars. I think, I think Elon Musk has got, you know, He's a smart guy and all that other stuff, but I don't know what Tesla's worth. I don't know what Apple's worth. I think I have an iPhone. It's great, but I don't know if Apple's worth 140 or 240 or 40. Um, and nobody does, right? That's the price discovery process. Now, if you have enough money, you can make it go higher because you can just buy enough. But my point is, is that it's always a little bit different. And the change of the change of the change in the third order derivative, it's like predicting the weather. You can only get so far out. You can be pretty accurate about tomorrow because you look out the window like, yeah, it's sunny. It's going to be sunny again tomorrow. But you have no idea what it's going to be like in six months. And maybe in December, it's 80 degrees. And maybe in July, it's eight degrees. You have no idea. Now, all you can really do is use your, your, your data set that's in arrears. You can put a program on it that, you know, trains off that data. And then you do your best. And at some point, you put your finger in the air. And if you don't think that everyone does that at some level, you don't understand how the business works. Because everybody has to make some kind of a judgment. Because if you are only looking at the data, you have the same data everybody else has. And you have a totally inconsensus opinion and you will not make money, not for any period of time anyway. You have to make some judgments. Now, also, Jason, yeah. like uh, with the, the framework that you were just describing, um, that's also a Kelly problem. Like all things come back to Kelly with me, but like that's a Kelly problem where the prop owner or owners have to make a decision in terms of allocation. Okay, is this guy who's in micro caps and he's doing really well and he's running at 300% annualized right now. How much do we size to him? Do we size more with him? But then how correlated is he to our options guy who's doing small cap options, ball trading, right? Like, are they too kind of correlated and just taking advantage of a really profitable regime for their particular edges? And so if so, I want to be careful that I don't get concentrated or corner risk by allocating too much, like let's say, 30% of the firm's assets split between these two traders, right? So again, like even at the, the business owner level, it's still sort of a Kelly criterion sizing yes. dilemma. Yes. So but if you own a firm, I know a guy who, who trades Nat Gas who's up nine figures this year. That doesn't mean it happens every year, you know, because Nat Gas is crazy hot right now. But it won't right. always be that way. Right. I wonder, if we're, right. I wonder if we know the same guy, but part of that though is like, Darren was trying to set me up though there, Noel. So I'm, I want, I'm gonna ask you, so that way I don't have to get set up here. It's like, how do you think about Kelly criterion? Is it a Luddick fallacy? Is continuous Kelly even, you know, in, in markets that have a, a broad distribution of returns, could you ever even know what a proper Kelly sizing is? 
I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't think that it, these, these things like are all knowable. Like you said, finger in the air kind of thing. Like you, you, you do a best approximation of like a rough band of, of correlations is kind of similar with the Kelly sizing, right? So say you say you take all the data, right? I mean, literally all the data. What did Socrates say to his aunt in you know in the year 600 BC? I don't know, but you know that's in your data set, right? You know everything there is to know about everything. You still only know about what happened. You don't know about what's going to happen and how those things all interact. So the the, the predictive nature of that and how you allocate and apportion your, your your risk or your risk capital to that, I don't know that you can always be right on that. And because if you were, the data does exist. The people that have the most data and the best programs to parse that data would have all of the money. And I mean almost literally all of it. M many, many, many trillions, put it that way. Darren, I don't want to I didn't want to get us into a, a Kelly. Like you and you and have uh, you and Sinclair have done a great job. Everybody should go out, read Ewan's work on, on Kelly and, and listen to anytime Darren's talked about it. It's phenomenal, but it's one of the ones I, I always like to poke him a little bit with. But um part of it, okay, changing tact a little bit. Um, no, I'm always trying to get maybe Darren to move, uh, move, maybe move a little closer to where we are. Um, is there like a big prop community in Tahoe? I mean, I know like, isn't like Ed Dakota's <laughs> up in like Incline Village or something like, have you met any other real traders there? Or is that the point of why you live in Tahoe to get away from all the traders? No, I live in Tahoe because it's a cool place to live. That's it. Darren, Darren had a great question too. And maybe Darren can illuminate it. But the idea is too, is like, if you have all these parameters for a prop shop, how do you ensure and, and make you know, cognitive diversity, ethnic diversity, and almost like outside the box thinking, if everybody's almost aggregating kind of towards the same resume or the same trading style or, or things like that, maybe Darren, you can say it in a different way um, than I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I was just thinking that how do you avoid the problem that you see playing out with a lot of publicly traded companies um, right now, which is like you end up the ideal candidate, at least you think, right, is is such a specific avatar or a specific mm -hmm. profile that really just feeds into your biases. So you end up with a bunch of rich, mostly prestigious university grads um, who are STEM, who have had 10, 15, 20 years of experience, et cetera, et cetera, have an established track record. That's great. But then we're really just as prop owners we're just being pitted against each other by mercenaries who are looking for the best pay, pay split or compensation package, as opposed to, and this is what's really important to me and something that I care a whole lot about, which is I care about the people who actually don't meet those filters. Like I know what that's like. And those, and, and, and a lot of those people do suffer greatly. Maybe they went to a state school and they suffer from imposter syndrome. So mm -hmm. like a job description on LinkedIn, that is that specific. It's worded in very business financing language um they don't even apply even though that could be the person with loads of potential and also most importantly like a truly idiosyncratic diverse worldview on trading you know like like a lot the, like there are several retail people that i know that are like i don't understand why everybody's talking about it's a it's a difficult environment um you know i'm doing better than ever and like i know i'm running hot like my sharp is running at a nine right now and I know that's not realistic over the long haul, but I'm doing really well and I don't get it. Well, it's because this person was never formally trained, right? They were never indoctrinated with the way to think about markets, the way to present themselves, the way to think about diversification, the way to think about edge. They just kind of had some basic quant skills and some applied math skills and, and a, a temperament that was amenable to speculation. And they just took all those things and they figured it out on their own. Um, now, whether that's scalable and that can fit into a business model is a whole different thing. But that's the kind of person that I care the most about. Our mutual friend who is at one of the large firms, um, like he's a great guy and he's our friend. But like I care about the people who didn't have all those opportunities. And so how do you maintain standards, but also really try to reach and get like unique perspectives in, in diverse individuals? Um I guess that's, yeah, that's my question. So I came from the inner city of Chicago. I didn't come from money. Um, my background is nothing like what my LinkedIn page would suggest. Nothing at all. I went to a state school. I was in the military, et cetera. I'm more aware of what you're saying without all the words that you didn't put in there than you probably think. And I totally get it. Um, there are some things like I, we never had any females. I put many females on the interview list 
I've interviewed them. And frankly, they just didn't qualify. We were not not hiring women, but we did not hire women. And the reason is because they didn't meet our criteria. Uh, I don't I don't care if we were all women, but we didn't have any women. Um, I purposefully tried to make it I tried to hire people that I thought would add value first and foremost, and maybe somebody else would pass over for whatever ridiculous reason that I didn't care about because that's not my background. And I, I very much, anybody that's ever done right by me, I always wanted to pay it forward. And if I have got two people in front of me, I'm going to try to give an opportunity to somebody that I think maybe wouldn't get it someplace else. That's my nature. That doesn't mean it's right. It's just how I did things. Um, but, you know, there are a certain amount of skills that you have to have to play in the NBA. You have to be tall. You have to be athletic. And just because you want to hire, you know, somebody who's short and non-athletic, that doesn't mean he's a good pot. That doesn't mean he's a good hire. Um, it just is what it is. You have to have some kind of quantitative heft. You have to have some skills that are relevant to the business. But once you reach those table stakes, um, my feeling is that you should consider all people. But then there's also the time function, right? So you have to figure out, okay, well, I can't just, you know, interview 10,000 people. So you have to do your best. And the first part of what you said, which was, how do you not have, you know, automatons of yourself? Yes. I don't, I don't know that you can. I've tried to do that and I failed. Um, I learned this through time. And then, especially when you're the boss, your jokes are always funnier. Your, your shoes are always shinier <laughs> and everyone's always kind of, you know, brown nosing you. But I noticed that after a certain period of time where I thought I was hiring people that were dissimilar from me, despite their, their ethnic background or whatever else, they were more similar to me than I thought. Um, I, despite my best efforts, I'm going to say I failed. And I've seen this through so many different firms where the guy in charge is the guy that stems the culture. And a lot of it exudes from that person. Mm. The answer yeah, is, I don't know. It, it, yeah, it's hard to get that cognitive diversity, like you're saying. And, and Darren, I almost throw the question back to you because I, I think about it too. Is like, if, like you're saying, somebody is like more introverted or they might be potentially intimidated by, let's just say, like a LinkedIn ad for a job posting or whatever, it's like, how do you get around that? Like, how do you, how do you help somebody that's intimidated by just that job posting to try to find those, di those diverse people to hire? And then, so, and then the second part of that would be if you feel that there's an edge there. As, a, as three entrepreneurs sitting here, don't you think there's a, there's a structure that then you could build and you could kind of think through how do, you, how do you find those people or filter those people or catch those people if you think there's true value add there and you could build a business around it? I think it's a lot like trying to find a spouse or a serious partner, long-term partner. Um, I've, as somebody who's had reasonable success with the opposite sex, um, but what I, figured, what I figured out was the best relationships, including my wife now, um, have come from, and I, I mean, I hate to say this, and this is kind of why the system is the way it is, but it's come from like personal interactions and me. Pro so in other words, it's, I've always had really bad luck with passive dating, right? Where I'm just like, okay, I'm going to wait for this girl to show major interest in me. She's extremely attractive, whatever, but I'm going to play more of a passive role. That never worked. What I found with dating, and I'm, I, I also found it with hiring when we had our logistics company, was like whether I was at a coffee shop or I was anywhere, or I was at the doctor's office with Cam when he was a baby. Like the fact of the matter was, if I recognized something in somebody, and I was like, "Man, you know, you are exceptional at customer service," and you could be at, you know, uh, the local coffee shop just outside of Dallas by my house, I'll actually talk to that girl and say, "You know what, like." Have you ever thought about just like a part-time job and like i know you don't have any experience with like logistics or anything like that but you're so good and so conscientious and i can just tell this immediately like let me just exchange contact information with you and and that person ended up coming and working for me right that's how i've always found people that's how i found casey my wife right like like it's always been a very proactive process and i think when you are big bank and when you have the capital the temptation can be to just sit back and let people play hunger games with each other. Just kick back and let them feud in the last one standing, the survivors, that's why I'll pick. That ha that always has failed for me. I've never been good at that. Maybe I've just never been that adequately capitalized to allow that to work, but that never worked for me. For me, it was always a very messy 
very manual, very proactive process. That's how I've always found the best people. And that's been true with because I hate networking. Right. But I inadvertently end up doing it because, like, I build real relationships with people. But that's a very long term, very messy process. It's not formulaic at all. I, I agree. I, I I don't think you can, especially in the quantitative world, there are so many different quirky people. I've had guys that work for me that, that are very weird people that are still good people and very smart. When I was in high school, I wanted to become a neurosurgeon. So what I did is I called up a neurosurgeon out of the yellow pages and I asked if I could come, you know, hang out and learn about his business. Um, so he said, yeah. So I'm, I'm 16 and I find myself in the neurosurgical ward at Condell hospital in Liberty, Libertyville, Illinois. This guy had a brutal stutter. So you're like, hi doctor. He's like, uh, hello. <laughs> and you know, it's very, it's very disarming because you know, he's a genius, but yet he has a speech impediment. Those two things aren't really relevant. He is still a genius, despite the fact that he doesn't speak maybe the way you anticipate him to. Same thing applied for me. And that lesson was very deeply learned that, you know, if I just met him at the coffee shop and I didn't know he was a neurosurgeon, I would think he was just unintelligent. How unintelligent of me to assume that how unfair of me to judge him so fast. So I learned that young and I learned that and I've never forgot it. So when I had guys that come interview for me or girls that come interview for me, I didn't care at all what they came off like. I only cared that they, like going back to the beginning of our conversation, how are you going to make me money? Because this is a business. And I don't care if you did that with long hair, short hair, curly hair, blue shirt, red shirt. Don't care. What are you going to do for me? And what are you going to do for yourself? That's it. That's yeah, perfect. Like, I think it was Nancy Davis talked about it on a recent interview. It's like she loved trading because it was just PL. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what you look like or what you do. As long as you can get some, find your way to get a wedge or foot in the door, it's all yep. down to PL in our business. Yep. And so hopefully, they don't care. Um, yeah. I want to thank both you guys. And hopefully, um, hopefully both Noel and my compliance will allow us to, to, to publish this podcast. I think they will. But I think there's a lot of little nuggets of value in there for a lot of um, DIY or prop traders and, and different things for, for people to think about. And I appreciate both of you. Uh, coming on and, and being willing to do this and just so for everybody listening as soon as we stop record I know these guys were probably going to talk a little bit after but I hope you got a clear understanding during this podcast that there, we're not going to talk about secrets after we turn off the recording there are no secrets everything was laid out in this podcast about how all of us have, have gotten to where we are um, so yeah there are no secrets other than what we talked about in this podcast so both Noel Darren thanks guys for coming on I appreciate it and I look forward to our future conversations thank you Cool. Thanks for having me, Justin. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate it if you would share this show with friends and leave us a review on iTunes as it helps more listeners find the show and join our amazing community. To those of you who already shared or left a review, thank you very sincerely. It does mean a lot to us. If you'd like more information about Mutiny Fund, you can go to mutinyfund.com. For any thoughts on how we can improve the show or questions about anything we've talked about here on the podcast today, drop us a message via email. I'm taylor at mutinyfund.com and Jason is jason at mutinyfund.com or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at Taylor Pearson ME and Jason is at Jason Mutiny. To hear about new episodes or get our monthly newsletter with reading recommendations, sign up at mutinyfund.com slash newsletter. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Mutiny Fund, their affiliates or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants of this podcast are instructed to not make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. Listeners are reminded that managed features, commodity trading, forex trading and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors and you should not rely on any of the information as a substitute for the exercise of your own skill and judgment in making a decision on the appropriateness of such investments. Visit mutinyfund.com disclaimer for more information.